Well, hello there, team, and welcome. I'm Sean Wilsey, geology professor, and we're going to discuss some of the things going on in Iceland today. It's January 29th, about 1.30 p.m. here in Idaho, Mountain Standard Time, and about 8.30 p.m. in Iceland over there in the evening. Thanks again for joining me. Uh, appreciate your viewership, appreciate you tuning in to get my geologic take on things, provide some information, learn together. That's what it's all about. I've been doing a fewer of these updates as of late, partly because the semester began, I'm back in classes, so I've got a little less time to devote to these. But my goal is to continue to, to provide updates like this for you when I think there's sufficient information to share. Obviously, when we're in, in the midst or uh, if a, an eruption is imminent, that might be more frequent. And then we might have lulls in activity like we've had these last few weeks where these updates are spaced out over a few days. But I always try to post other videos on my YouTube channel, so look for some other geology content videos, even though you may not be interested you're only interested possibly in what's happening in Iceland. I try to share geology education uh, mainly from the field across a lot of platforms and so look for a few of those videos. And then one last announcement is I will be appearing on a fellow geologist YouTube channel on a live stream this Sunday February 4th at uh, 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time which would be 5 p.m. UTC. Um, and so his name is Nick Zentner and a lot of you probably know him. He's a very prolific geologist. He's been doing a lot of outreach to the public over the last decade or so. And so if you go to his YouTube channel, again, Nick Zentner, Z-E-N-T-N-E-R, -E uh, that's where you'll find me this Sunday. I'll try to also record it and then post it on my YouTube channel as well. Hopefully that's possible and we can get that all figured out. So let's jump right into this update. Um, obviously no eruption has happened yet, but we're, I believe we're in this period where it's very likely that we have an eruption within the next few weeks. I think that period more or less started maybe a little less than a week ago and now we're sort of in, in the midst of that that time period and so we'll have to see you know when that eruption might occur it really could occur at any point and in the past we've seen with these eruptions in Iceland that you can go from very little happening to a quick swarm of earthquakes within a few hours culminating in an eruption so exactly when and exactly where that eruption occurs is anyone's guess um, but we'll continue to look at the information we'll monitor the situation uh, I'm in contact with the, the good folks at NatureEye that have the drones, and if something looks like it's going to happen or has already happened, uh, we'll of course try to respond and do what we can, realizing of course that uh, we've got the situation around the town, um, there's certain access issues and other barriers that might be in place, but we'll go ahead and, and do the best we can with, with what we've been given. So today what we'll do is we'll go through the, the data real quick and the science. Um, I've got a few news items I want to get to. I also want to include and share with you some information from Amanda Joe, our good friend who is a Gudendivik resident that has been displaced since early November away from her home. I've got some information she shared, which I think is really interesting. Uh, and then also I asked her a little bit about like just her her sort of feelings on the situation. And she said, uh, I was fine to share those here as well. So I'll share sort of the general thrust of those. And then we'll finally finish up with uh, some Q&A. Last Wednesday, I did a live stream update and we had a session of Q&A and we had Susan, our moderator, uh, aggregating the questions and then getting those to me. And once I got the second batch of questions, I thought that was kind of it, maybe time-wise, but there was actually a third email that she sent me with another batch of questions. So I don't want those folks to think that uh, their questions went unchecked. So we'll, we'll circle back and include those today. So let's just jump right in with the earthquake data. Now, right now there's a lot of bad weather going on in Iceland. It's very stormy, it's windy, and so that could be dampening our ability to get all the seismic uh, events captured by the seismometers there. The one somewhat significant event is you can see a couple earthquakes here southeast of the Reykjavik area and there was a magnitude 3 earthquake here 
a few days ago. Right now we just have these smaller ones, um, but there was one significantly larger event. And there was, of course, some aftershocks there. And these, these quakes here undoubtedly are related to that and could be aftershocks themselves. Let me show you on the Google Earth where this area is. That might make a little more sense. So uh, we're mainly looking at this region here. Here's Reykjavik and the greater Reykjavik area. And then there is a, another volcanic system over here. This is the Brennesteinsfjöld system, this volcanic system. And you can see some of these lava flows here that have erupted in the past. And so we did have an earthquake in here. It's too early, and I'll mention this more when we get to the news, but I think it's much too early to say that this is, you know, at all related to a possible magmatic intrusion or possible start of a volcanic event. Um, just like we've seen over here in the Krishuvik system, we've had earthquakes triggered along these tectonic uh, systems related to the plate boundary. Uh, as a result of these the changing stress fields over here where the eruption has taken place. So um, we'll get to that later, but we did have that one earthquake I wanted to mention. So probably getting ahead of myself a bit there. Uh, otherwise, going back to the Grindavik area, and of course we've got uh, some weather to deal with there, so we're probably not seeing the full suite of seismic signals that we might from this region. Not a lot going on there. If we switch over to the Met Office, which shows uh, last 48 hours, and we look at this bottom plot here. You can see that when we had a little bit better weather on Sunday, we were getting picking up a lot, a lot more earthquakes there. Uh, and some of these, these bigger ones here, that's that three magnitude three I mentioned that occurred right there in that area. So there were uh, more earthquakes being detected a day or so ago, but now with the really nasty stormy conditions, we're probably picking up fewer of those. Uh, but overall, I'd say nothing out of the ordinary, nothing super alarming, and nothing I'm seeing here that's uh, ind indicative of some bigger volcanic episode uh, about to take place. Let's look at the last Met Office update. So their last update was last Thursday on the 25th. So they haven't done a, a, a recent update on Friday or today, Monday. Um, so we've got here magma accumulation continues under the Svartsengi area. Uh, land rise continues. In recent days, it's risen up to eight millimeters per day, which is slightly faster than what was measured before the January 14th eruption, so that's notable. Uh, at this point, it's difficult to say how much magma has accumulated since the eruption ended on January 16th. So we don't know how much of the total magma, well, we do know how much magma was, was erupted, but we don't know what percentage that erupted magma represents compared to the whole. Um, so we don't know how much was left after the January uh, 14th eruption, and we don't know uh, how much more magma has been intruded or um, is moved into the system. Uh, reading on further, it's likely that the time it takes to reach the same level of magma as before the last eruption is measured in weeks rather than days. So this, it could take weeks uh, until we get to an eruptable supply of magma in the system. Uh, computational models are being worked on to get a clearer picture. Seismic activity remains mild and mostly around Hagafelt. So that's the, the location of the last eruption. Uh, it can be said that the seismic activity... My light just went off again. Well, maybe it's staying off, so... Um, it can be said that the seismic activity it's currently being measured is in line with the activity that's been observed in the area following volcanic eruptions. So yeah, we're seeing most of the seismic signal is where we had the eruption. Um, and then I think they made a slight update to the hazard map, but probably nothing uh, too big of a deal to discuss here. So I'll just probably skip over that for now because I really didn't see uh, a significant change there. Uh, let's look at the GPS data. So in looking at the GPS data, we've been focusing primarily most of our time on the GPS station near the power plant because this one seems to be most centrally located over the magma sill or the magma chamber or magma body, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so again, looking at the red dots here, this is uplift. So if the dot moves up on the graph, that means the GPS station moved up during that eight hour period. 
and so you can see this steady trend upward here uh, leading to the November 10th event when magma intruded into the dike off to the east. That dike did not erupt on November 10th, although we think it came very close. Uh, and then you can see the uplift that occurred after November 10th going into December. And that led up to the December 18th eruption that we had. And so then you can see a down drop or at this GPS station, so a deflection downward in the data. And then land elevation continued to rise over Christmas into the end of December and into first part of January. And then we had the January 14th eruption, which did not at this location result in a down drop on the GPS station, which is interesting. So possibly reflecting it only erupted a very small amount compared to the overall supply of magma in the system. And then we've seen it steadily increase. There's, you know, if you get in here in the in the detail, you can see there's some slight rises and falls in the data um, that you can, you know, you can see it's kind of flat here, and then it ramps up, and then maybe flattens out a bit, and then there's a little bit of a steeper slope. Uh, but overall, just a fairly steady accumulation, well, a steady increase in the elevation, which we think reflects the influx of magma into the system. So we're well beyond the, the thresholds or the elevation thresholds that prove to be sort of the trigger point for November 10th and December 18th. Um, but it's likely that so much of this this rock has been heated up that it's, be able, it's able to behave much more ductily. So it's able to bend and flow without actually breaking. If we look at another station off to the west, the Eldvorp station, uh, this one nicely shows the three big events, November 10th, December 18th, January 14th. And then interestingly enough, this one, which is located further away from the magma body, sort of on the flank of it, notice that the last two eruptions, the elevation at this GPS station was pretty much the same and that we're getting about to that now. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that it, that, you know, that that's going to be, the elevation that the eruption takes place at. This could trend uh, above that to some degree before we get an eruption, but if we just use those two as an indicator, which would not be great science, but something at least to hang your hat on and, and look look for, uh, we're pretty much about back to that point now. So, And you can dig into the GPS data. I'll make sure it's on the links. Um, there's all sorts of things you can dig into here and look at. Uh, the Blue Lagoon station that they installed after the November 10th event. You can see that rise. There's that December 18th eruption, steep rise, January 14th eruption. And now at this station, we're, we're well above that, right? So we, our uplift has exceeded. You can see it's actually stepped up each time with each eruption, uh, possibly indicating the sort of uh, ductile behavior of the rocks there. Uh, because it's being heated up by the magma. Um, okay, what do I want to go to next? Uh, let's go to some news. So they've continued to work on the the defensive barrier. So just as a reminder, the pink here is where we had the eruption on January 14th. The orange line where it's solid is what this berm or wall or protective barrier where it was built prior to that eruption. So you can see that it in large part uh, diverted a good portion of the flow off to the west. They had another little secondary section here, but this site nicely shows, I believe in the dotted and dashed lines, this is where they hope or expect to extend it. So as far as I know, uh, they're continuing to work on lengthening that protective wall. So it more or less surrounds the town on all sides. Now, of course, what happened on January 14th was we had, you can see with these red lines here, we had some of these fissures, some of these volcanic vents open up um, within that protective area. And so that didn't prove to be very, very effective. Um, but so now what they're doing is, is bringing that barrier about as close to the houses as they can, uh, recognizing that having the vents open up just beyond the the, the, the town area um, would be the best case scenario, obviously. So, so this map nicely shows that. Uh, and then we have a few articles that 
popped up today from some of the Iceland geologists. So uh, Professor Thordarsson here, who's at the University of Iceland, uh, the headline. And again, I wonder, you know, there, I don't want to read into this too much, but I would like to think they're having conversations with, with the volcanologists and the geologists. And a lot of times the media wants the, the, the soundbite, the clickbait thing. And so they're going to probably try to press the person they're talking to and interviewing to get to get that nugget that would make the the best headline. Uh, so, he, you know, it says, thinks it's possible that magma is gathering under Husfeldsbrunna. Uh, lava could flow near Reykjavik. So this is the area near, this is following that earthquake. So we had that earthquake out in this region. This region has erupted in the past when la lava erupts from vents in this area. It primarily flows to the northwest towards the capital area. Um, and in one particular instance over here, you can still see some of these lava flows that went into uh, some of these neighbor, well, the neighborhoods weren't there, but they lava flows underlay some of these neighborhoods that have been built um, since those eruptions hundreds of years ago. Uh, and so, you know, he's just basically saying that it's possible that magma may have begun to accumulate at great depth underneath where this earthquake occurred. Um, and that the lava, if you know, last time this happened, lava flowed very close to the capital city. I don't think he's necessarily saying that that's what's going to happen. And it, and I'll acknowledge it just as readily that could that magnitude three earthquake and those aftershocks be an indication that magma is starting to accumulate here and that an eruption could occur here? Like I have to acknowledge that's a possibility, but right now we're just not seeing any direct data. There's no uplift of GPS stations. There's no seismic swarms. So for now, I think the most conservative and prudent measure would be to consider these quakes that are happening to the east of the uh, where we're having the eruptive activity um, as being tectonically triggered earthquakes. Basically, we're re uh, we're the stress levels in, in this part of the, the Reykjanes Peninsula are being modified by the seismic and the volcanic activity, and that's putting stress on these fracture and fault systems, and some of these are being reactivated with a few earthquakes. But I'm not seeing anything that suggests that uh, something bigger is going to take place. But of course, you know, that what I just said is kind of boring and would never make a headline, and, you know, taking the, the fringe thing, the 1% thing and running with it uh, is always a little bit more exciting. A similar article from a different volcanologist there. Uh, so the Brennan Stainfields area, that same area I was, I was pointing to there. Um, and in this one, he, he brings up the idea that, <clears throat> excuse me, public officials should be considering some protective measures. So just like we have these uh, in yellow here, these protective berms that have been and are being built around Gudindivik and the power plant in the Blue Lagoon, that we should probably start thinking sooner rather than later about designing and implementing similar structures uh, around the capital city area, the greater capital area, because we know eruptions there in the past have moved in that direction, um, could inundate parts of these areas again, and so it seems proactive to get ahead of it and maybe put put some of these uh, protective measures in place sooner rather than later. So, uh, so interesting articles there. I'll make sure I include those in the links in case you want to digest those in uh, full detail. Um, I want to share with you this map. So this was shared with me from Amanda Joe. And so as a Gudindivik resident, this is what they've been given. You can see all the individual houses on here. So we can zoom in a little bit here, make this a little bit bigger. Um, they've got the whole town divided up into zones. So like, for example, here's H1, over here is V3. So little sections, including a certain number of houses. Um, the escape routes are shown in green. So there's a roadway that, is, that leaves town off to the east. You can similarly go to the west. Uh, and you can also, this is the little back road here that takes you um, 
off to the northwest and, and ends up in the Blue Lagoon area before kind of heading back to the main uh, Road 43 that heads heads to the north and towards uh, the airport. Um, but this shows, and there's a lot to lot to digest here. I'm not going to read all of this uh, to you. And this, I don't know, I don't know if this is public or not, um, but this is what the residents were given. So there's checkpoints uh, along the way out on the major roads. And then they've got each little area subdivided. And from what she told me, each uh, area is allowed to visit on certain days um, and at certain times. So let me share with you, I'm looking over here at an email she sent me um, that gives some more information and maybe some context for what you're seeing here on this map. Oh, a couple other things on the map. You can see uh, the orange lines are cracks in town or fractures that have opened up. Uh, and let me maybe zoom, let me make that a little bit smaller there. Um, well, let's make this bigger. There we go. Uh, so you can see where some of the fractures or cracks go through town. The red area here is a dangerous area that's fenced off. So that's where some of the greatest damage in town is in terms of where some of these cracks, you can see these two main cracks coming in from the north that come right through town and then pass just near this main intersection by the, the rec center complex and the swimming pool. Uh, so that's where a lot of the worst damage is. And so those areas are closed or fenced off. Um, but let me read you what she's got on just sort of the protocols and procedures that they are following there. So they are asked to, and let me switch to a little different view here because I think this will be more instructive. Uh, let me get rid of a bunch of the, we don't need all this stuff right now on this map. Let's make it simpler. Um, we can probably get rid of all of these too. We'll leave the Blue Lagoon and the power plant on there. There we go. So there's a nice simple map. So here we have Grindavik. This road, 43, we know was severed due to the eruption on January 14th, but they still have these other roads here, road 427, 425, and then this is the little sneaker back road I told you about. Um, and I think this is what a lot of the employees use. So this goes around uh, Thorpeorn, the hill right here, and then comes into the Blue Lagoon power plant, but then you can connect back to uh, road 43 right here. So here's what she says. So when the residents come in at their prescribed day and time, they are asked to come in from the east, which means they can uh, maybe come down road 42 uh, through the Krishuvik area and Lake Klevravatn, uh, or they or that road extends off along the coastline here. So they have to come in on this road. Um, and she says, and I'll just read from her email, that a lot of the residents are pretty upset uh, that they have to take that those roads. These roads are pretty remote and quite dangerous this time of year. They just had uh, quite a bit of snowfall. Um, and so it, it can be a pretty nasty trek to get all the way into uh, Grindavik. Uh, of course, the, the quickest and easiest route would be, you know, we've got the main road here from the airport to uh, Reykjavik and then road 43 here is clear and fine and they could take this road here around the Blue Lagoon and come right into town and that is the way they're allowed to exit but they are told that they need to go in one way and out the other so that there isn't like a bottleneck if people um, you know need to be turned around or if something's going on everyone that is a resident uh, has an electronic ID with a QR code and those have to be scanned so they're very much controlling access into town which makes sense um, and then once they're allowed into the town they're supposed to drive straight to their house park outside their house with a car facing the road so they can escape quickly and easily stay in, so stay inside as much as possible residents are not expected to go around town um, it's understandable that people might be interested in that, but we ask that they do not uh, just because it's a dangerous area with a lot of cracks in the ground. Uh, there's a lot of open trenches and cracks. Uh, the temperatures in the house have been set by some of the professionals that have been making repairs there to keep the buildings uh, from freezing. So they're not allowed to change a thing, only call if something's wrong. And then there's no cold water and hot water is not to be used. 
uh, no sewage, you can't use toilets, showers, sinks, etc. So obviously, you know, you wouldn't, you know, with those limitations, you can't really stay in town that long anyway, other than maybe just check on your things or, or grab something. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. But um, she said that people were pretty upset that they had to take these long, dangerous roads in when this road, you know, the Blue Lagoon's open. And of course, their guests are coming in on the this most direct route in and out. Uh, and she wonders why, you know, why can't the Grindavik residents be allowed to use that road? They can only take it going out. Coming in, they've got to come this much longer, more arduous and currently dangerous route given the the snow and some of the weather conditions over there so um so yeah i just wanted to share that with you all a little bit uh and then one last thing related to that so i just asked her kind of how she was feeling about things in general and she was okay with me sharing a little bit of her situation and so uh, her husband and her have some cats and dogs, and so that's made getting housing, uh, temporary housing, very difficult because a lot of the apartments and such that they've been looking to rent don't allow them. And so the place they're in now, I think she said, is a um, kind of like an industrial area. Um, yeah, she just says she's kind of full of emotion and empty and numb at the same time. So just kind of vacillating between these emotional extremes, which is very understandable. Um, they're living in unapproved housing in an industrial area because otherwise they'd have to give up their pets and they, their pets are part of their family. Um, and so, so they've got some dogs and cats. Um, she just talks about the frustration and some of the anger with just how things are organized and taking this road to get into town that they should be able to go in via the Blue Lagoon route, which is the most direct, um, but it feels like they're prioritizing some of the tourists over the residents. Um, they've struggled to find a new house. Um, they did find one and they put an offer in, so they're just waiting to hear back on that, but there's still all the unknowns of not knowing exactly how the loan will work out and how they'll get paid for their existing house, given that it's still there. So exactly how will that work um, financially? Um, and I think that's about it. Just, you know, just mentally, it's been very taxing, uh, and very hard to deal with. And again, like we've talked about here before, uh, the, the hardest thing might be that it just, it just sort of keeps going. Like there's no, there's no clear date. Oh, my light just came back on. There's no clear date or end in sight. You can't say, oh, if I just make it to February 1st, then these things will happen and we can put some of this behind us. So um, just wanted to share some of you have been asking about her and I know she appreciates it as as do I. So I just wanted to share some of her direct um, uh, thoughts and feelings with you as best I could. So let's then turn to the Q&A that I didn't get to last Wednesday. And so I'll try to run through these. There's maybe, I don't know, eight or 10 questions. Uh, see if we can go through these. I'll try to give them a good answer, but I'm not going to spend uh, you know, too long on each one. So from the device nine, and again, thanks to Susan for being our moderator and putting uh, the questions together. It makes it so much easier for me to address those questions when they're all laid out and put together rather than scrolling through the live chat and trying to pick them out. So the device nine, what do you think are the odds that dramatic volcanic activity just settles down and does nothing for years maybe? I think it's really low. I think uh, we've seen five eruptions now in three years, um, actually a little less than three years, right? Something like that. And so it's very high probability that we have eruptions in this region on the Reykjanes Peninsula a couple times a year, at least, maybe more often. Uh, right now we've had two eruptions within less than a month of each other. Yeah, so I don't think it's going to settle down and just kind of quit for a while. So uh, from Charles W53, have you made a video from Thingvellir and Geyser, Iceland, the Graben and Waterfall, and is impressive. Um, I did do one at Golfos, so the big waterfall that's near Thingvellir. I did not do a video at Thingvellir. I've been there several times. It's always just so 
crowded with people. I think I'd like to do one there. It would probably just, I just need to pick a time. Probably just a lousy weather day would be the best option when there's just not as many people milling around and I can have a little mo more mobility and and such. So maybe in the future I'll get I'll get those in as well. From B Brian Lesh Lashkowicz, um, are you aware of anyone who's using AI tools to examine past eruption data to do some analysis? That's an interesting idea, but I am not aware of anyone who's doing that. Um, you know, looking, taking what we know about past eruptions and then using AI possibly as a predictive tool moving forward. Interesting idea. Um, I'd like to think there's some smart people out there that might be playing with that right now, but I don't know for sure. From Mercala Karnstein, uh, this may be a question for another time, but I saw a new study about how the Indian plate seems to be delaminating. How does this affect the tectonic activity in the region? Um, yeah, I don't know much about that. I, I maybe have read an article or two about plates delaminating and how that might affect things, but I don't know much about the Indian plate, so I'll just I'll just punt on that one. But thanks. Uh, another question from Charles W. 53. Is there reliable near surface seismic tom tomographic techniques now or in development? 3D mapping that can show magma, semi solidified material, faults, etc. Um, we do have some technology that helps with that. Uh, I am not a geophysicist, so I don't know all the ins and outs of how that works. Maybe it's very cost prohibitive. Maybe it only works in certain areas. Maybe you need a very extensive seismic array. To my knowledge, that's not been used in Iceland so far, so I can't speak to that. But uh, it's, a, it's a promising tool if we can employ it. From Paul P., in what conditions seven-ish magnitude earthquakes on deep like 100 kilometers would have significant impact? Oh boy, I don't, I can't quite decipher that question. And maybe it came in the flow of the live chat, and so I don't have the context, but um, not sure what you're asking there. Sorry, Paul. Uh, from RAP, GPS data, Svartsengi, the upward movement indicates increasing magma intrusion. Though I believe the upper crust is dense at this location, what could that potentially mean for the power plant? Well, the interesting thing, I think if I'm reading this question right, is we have, um, you know, the, the, the power plant in the Blue Lagoon area here, and this greater uh, Svartsengi area, and the, the that exact that GPS station sits right here. So when we look at that GPS station, uh, and we have looked at it a lot, here's the actual location of it. So it's just north of the power plant. And yeah, there's something going on here where the magma, and the magma's down five kilometers, right? So about three miles down. Um, the magma's finding easier pathways to the surface, at least so far, by moving off to the east um, and erupting in some of these places over here. So we saw it erupt over here on December December 18th and then it moved more to the southeast and erupted here on January 14th. Uh, and so there's something about the the architecture of the rocks above the the magma body here that prohibits it at least now from finding a pathway upwards and directly above it. And that's more common than you'd think, you know, the, the sort of cartoon idea of a magma chamber and then a line or a pipe conduit going directly vertically up from that magma chamber is the way we draw, it's the way I draw it in my classes, because um, it's simple, but it's rarely actually, you know, the, the way things actually work. So, um, Hopefully I, I helped with that question a little bit there. So something could be could be there's an older intrusion sitting above it. So those rocks are very dense and competent and lack fractures. And so that's what's keeping the magma from moving up there. But what could it mean for the power plant? Uh, right now, I don't think the power plant has been affected. I have not heard anything about the power plant being affected by all everything that's happened the last three months other than they've had to have a defensive wall built around them and there's there's uh the workers can't go in there as often they were operating remotely um, but in terms of power plant production and the temperatures in the groundwater remember that the power plant's tapping a much shallower groundwater system and the magma system is much deeper and those two aren't 
as readily connected as, as you might think. Uh, from Helena Bowie, as lava cools, do gas bubbles evaporate? What about in basaltic lava? Um, so as lava rises to the surface, especially in basaltic lava, those gases can escape pretty easily. So as, the, as it's rising towards the surface, the gas bubbles are in the lava. That's what makes the little holes or what we call vesicles in, in the resultant rock. Um, but once that lava makes its way to the surface, most of that gas is then released into the atmosphere. So it's not really that they evaporate. Evaporate. That's not really the right word because that's um, going from liquid to gas. And the gas bubbles are already in gas phase. And so um, evaporate, evaporate means we're changing something from a liquid phase to a gas phase. So... TC-1000 seems a lot of fluid dynamics even with, it, with solid earth. Can this be like a large wave swell breaking and the back of the wave still pulling to shore, east, west, north, south, and uplift at GPS? Um, yeah, I'm probably not catching the context that that question was posed in either, so I don't know exactly what they're referring to or talking about. Um, maybe he's just looking at the complete GPS array and movement, um, but the movement is not like liquid, you know, like water sloshing around like a wave or a swell. Um, this is solid rock. This is rocks that have different properties. So it's not a isotropic medium throughout. It's hard and dense here. It's weak and porous there. It's, it's different vertically, it's different laterally. And that's what's playing probably part of a role in determining how we see uh, the movement in the GPS data. Uh, from this individual, so occasionally we'll see specks of lava peeking out from the existing lava field from the last eruption. Are those harmless since lava won't erupt in the same place twice? Um, well, lava can erupt in the same place twice. You have, you have conduits that, uh, a, a vent, a centralized vent that is is fed more than once. Um, yeah, but the places in general, when you have a, a lava field and it's mostly done erupting, and it's starting to cool and crystallize and you see some little skylight or window through that hardened crust into the interior where it's glowing. Um, yeah, it's largely harmless other than it's still quite hot. Um, but yeah, so I think that's what they're asking there. Um, from Rap, oh, too bad I didn't realize we need to send our questions at the beginning in, or in one of the batches sent to Sean. Well, yeah, so I think uh, the way Susan does those is she just, as the questions come in, she's putting them in a Word document for me. Once she gets, you know, 10 to 12 or so, she'll send that to me. And then she starts accumulating more of them. So, but you made it here on the third batch. So there you go. From Scotty, last question. Is there a risk of sulfur dioxide, etc., entering the Blue Lagoon, given the amount of activity in the area? The answer to that is mostly no. The only way we're going to get sulfur dioxide in the Blue Lagoon is if the eruption is right in this area. So we would need to have either a lava flow come into the Blue Lagoon or the eruption and the vent open up near the Blue Lagoon in order to have those concentrated uh, sulfur dioxide and other gases in that region. So yeah, uh, so the way things stand right now and the way things are looking, uh, very low likelihood of that taking place. So um, I think that's it team, we did it, well done. Hopefully I was helpful with some of your questions that you posed. I appreciate those. I appreciate you guys learning along with me. It very much is a group team effort as we wrap our heads around what's going on, try to make sense of it, try to learn from it. Um, the earth is a great teacher. Um, and at the same time, we're of course very sympathetic and um, thinking about how the, the human toll and the impacts this is having on some of the residents for, in Iceland as well. So. We'll go ahead and sign off with this episode here, January 29th. I will be back with you with another Iceland update. Who knows? Um, maybe with maybe tomorrow, maybe in three hours, maybe in three days, but certainly within a week or so. I'll try not to let more than a week go by without jumping on. And, and I'm sure within a week we should have quite a bit of data to look at and some new perspectives and uh, things we can discuss. So we'll just see you at the next Iceland update. In the meantime, uh, please enjoy the other geology videos I'm putting together, some field-based ones. 
Um, again, I'll be on with Nick Zentner this Sunday, February 4th at 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, which is 5 p.m. UTC. I'll be talking about the Bonneville flood, this huge uh, cataclysmic flood that occurred through southern Idaho and a flood that I think is largely ignored. It's sort of like the, the forgotten flood, if you will, um, among the other great mega flood events that took place, especially in western uh, North America. So we'll see you next time. Take care, be well, and keep learning. Appreciate you. Thanks.